now. And I mean, you can, we can speak freely whenever uh, you feel compelled, like you don't have to answer every single thing. Um, you just, you chime in where you'd like. Um, but the first question I think I'd like everybody to contribute and it's just basically trying to find out what compelled you to be a part of this project. Like, why did you feel like this was something important to, to take part in? Can we go now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, for me, I think it was just I. I really have been hearing a lot about sustainability, and it's very easy to be caught up in like the buzzwords, you know, that are happening around the world, and not actually contributing or actively pursuing um, better ways of doing things. So I think for me, it was about one learning because this is something I have thought about. Um, and spoken about with other people at some point. And so this was just an opportunity to learn more about how to be more, you know, environmentally responsible as a black woman uh, who occasionally uses extensions for her hair. So, you know, I can save my hair and save the planet. So mm -hmm. why not? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alava. And yeah, I, I mean, just to chime in, I totally agree about there being this kind of buzzword culture around sustainability. So many people are using it lightly without actually unpacking and understanding what is constitutive of that, you know. So lately I've tried to maybe substitute the word sustainability for things that I don't know, delve a little bit more into the various sectors like low impact or local or ethical, because it just helps actually see it as like the wider picture as opposed to, to a very tight space. Yeah, I guess the term sustainability can be very overwhelming at times because I feel like whenever I think about climate change and sustainability, all these big terms I get very overwhelmed because then I realized in like how I am exactly not that in all of my little actions mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes I feel like maybe my because obviously you have an identity but you have different parts of your identity and then sometimes I feel like that might clash so when I saw your posts I thought that that was a, a really, really dope, good opportunity to combine two things with each. I don't know if you guys understand what I'm trying to say, but um, yeah, to just, it is, it's very solution orientated. And I like that we as black women, we are allowed to, like we can wear our hair in, in different ways and it can still be sustainable. That's a very, that was a very revolutionary idea to me that I am not going to lie, hadn't thought about before. And even when I found the Tiwani, when I like, cause I had just stumbled across the page a few days earlier. And that in itself was so interesting to me that two days later you would put up that post. It was like the universe was kind of like just sending me a, or us a message or I don't know, but yeah, it was just very revolutionary to me. And I'm, um, it's definitely something that I want to be a part of or that I'm interested uh, in learning more about. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's so true that sometimes, you know, you said your identity exists at intersection sometimes. And I feel like the intersection of environmentalism and being a black woman, I mean, they do intersect, but that narrative often isn't within the space or the platform to, to take form which is another reason I wanted to, to get uh, people together in a space like this to just, I don't know, create more awareness around the fact that this narrative exists, you know? So yeah. Um, Flora? Um, uh, personally, um, so I think I was, I shared the same sentiment. I'd never had the idea cross my mind, but, um, it's 2020 the world is kind of like upside downish or not at all but the idea of negotiating one's identity or oneself and 
in the world and like your impact in the world down to like the hair on your head like hair mm, 2020 so six years ago was when i really think about finding the essence of, of being and and me and my skin and my hair so now fast forward to um me seeing this on my friend's um page it was not externalizing the question of sustainability of what is ethical um of what is good for our ecosystem and the world and nature it was not externalized to oh i should use glass instead of plastic but it was coming back to my body and how i maybe perform myself how i put put on uh, my uh, my appearance as well um, I think I'm speaking specifically as well to my, myself as a performer and being seen. Um, so I wanted as well to like engage in this conversation because I'm really interested in learning. It's a learning curve, it's an exciting experience as well to really delve to what is ethical, what is useful, um, not just for myself, but for the next person and the environment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, just going back to the essence of it, I think is important because again, linking to what Joanna said about it being such an overwhelming big topic to tackle, we seem to externalize the solutions, you know, and we become so far removed from what it is that we actually have the power and the space to do. Um, so I love that you made that point, Sammy. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to chime in? Sorry, I sing like every four words. I don't know why. <laughs> um, um, I think I can go next. Um, I have something to contribute. I think it was just very um, interesting how, like most people who've gone before me, I think Joanna and Alaba did this, they said um, sustainability is such a huge sort of word that people don't actually put in thought into how they could each be sustainable and sometimes we think of it in a way that's like oh okay sustainability my my identity my personality who i am and who i've decided to be can't really be sustainable so i'm just gonna leave it it's not for me but like this project, your project, Benji, is saying um, black women can be more sustainable if they recycle the hair they use. And I just thought that was interesting because it's something that was something to do with sustainability and something that was very relatable to me as a black woman. So I was like, oh, I want to be part of this, you know. We're always saying, oh, be more sustainable. And it's like you're just throwing those words around in conversation and saying, oh, yeah, I am sustainable. And you're not really doing anything or being part of anything that's working towards that goal. So when I saw this, I was like, hey, I'm interested in that. So yeah, it was really timely. I've been thinking a lot about sustainability. So um, kind of, it, this kind of broke it down for me. And I was like, this is a practical way of being part of something more sustainable. So yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think um, just from my perspective, I think, um, you know, as, as I think a couple of you have already said, the idea of recycling extensions, actually, for, for me, as recently as a couple of years ago, wasn't something that was really a consideration of mine. But obviously, as you said, you know, sustainability and, and all of the knowledge and understanding that we have about the environment now is is a bit of a buzzword and there's definitely more that we can be doing around it and you, it's it's interesting because you start to find other ways to be sustainable that hadn't occurred to you once it's kind of on your own start in that way um and you know one of the things that we were really interested of is being a retailer of hair extensions and specifically synthetic hair extensions we didn't want to contribute to a known problem and just kind of be like oh buy some hair extensions and we don't care what you do with it when it's finished so we're trying to like take that kind of corporate responsibility seriously as well and, and also as well as doing our bit we also just want to educate people because there's a lot of people that still don't know about 
what they can do to be more sustainable or what they should be doing with synthetic hair extensions to be more sustainable so it's kind of we feel like it's our mission to help to educate and bring that awareness to the people that are you know are interested and want to learn so that's our mission as well um i think for me i it was it came i saw your post and joined the group at a time where um i had been without braids for i think the longest period ever like five months i think that's the longest i've gone without having braids and my natural hair and whenever i take out my braids i'd like think okay would someone actually use this i mean it's maybe i'd have the braids in for like a week or two or i'd have them in for a really long period of time and i'd wonder like can someone else actually use this and then be like maybe not and then you know throw them in the trash so when i saw it i i for me was answering a question that i'd been asking myself like can someone use these again um what happens after i throw them out i mean i'm going to for me personally i'm going to go out and buy more but what exactly does happen to them mm. so for me it was a way of getting an answer to that question and thinking about okay the next time i have braids in like now what can i do with them without being wasteful and without um you know being harmful to the environment mm. And you know what, I think because we live in such a hyper consumerist society, it doesn't leave enough time to critically think about our buying patterns because we're just buying and throwing away and buying and throwing away, which is why I think a lot of people um, haven't had this, I guess, this space to actually think about what you do when you take your braids out because i mean this isn't something i thought about until like five months ago you know and i'm so i, I would consider myself a pretty environmentally conscious person but this just happened to be one of the things that my mind just went zoop on you know and i think that's because of how closely intertwined hair is um with my identity as a black person or a black woman and i think sometimes the closer it's a double edged sword i think but sometimes the closer things are to your identity you either don't think about them at all or you think about them too much and i think this was one of the things that i just didn't consider because it was so so much so a part of the way i did things and the way people around me did things you know so it's just, I guess, a question of being able to critically think about things and then find viable solutions from that space in which you think, you know. Um, Samantha. Sorry, Banji, I was going to um, quickly say something. Um, I don't know if this would be preempting. I just want to go off what Kombe mentioned. She said something about how she never thought that um, about what happens, or she questioned rather herself and like what happens after um, I use these extensions, like would someone use this? Mm. And I don't know if that's something, if that's something people have thought about, but I won't, I would be very honest. In high school, I had braids all the time because it was just easier for me in the morning. And because I came from a family that was very, um, I wouldn't say were sustainable. It was more this thing of just not, I guess we didn't call it that, not having to waste extensions. Like if you could use them, you're going to use them again, you know, just rinse them in, in, in vinegar and then wash them out with shampoo and conditioner and use them again. And I don't think I ever thought of it of being all oh, this is sustainable. It's just like, oh, okay, I might not have money for extensions, in, in the next month so i should prepare myself mentally and i should be like okay let me wash my extensions and the next time i'm just gonna reuse them because i don't know if i'm gonna have money for extensions the next time so i just wanted to add a bit of 
that perspective. I think that's how I thought of this coming in as well. It yeah. was just very interesting. It wasn't from a sustainable point of view. It was just like, okay, I can save money here, you know? Mm, for sure. And in the last... I, I was, I was going to say the same thing as well. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So my thing about it was when I, when I saw the post, I was thinking to myself, when we were younger, it really wasn't a thing that you, you threw away your hair extensions. You always somehow recycled. And I don't know if it's that we didn't have money to do it. It's just so weird. But, um, but yeah, like nobody does that anymore. You, you get your hair extensions. Look at me, mine is so long. They go all the way to my, to my you know, but they're so long. And I'm, in my mind, I'm not thinking, oh, I'm going to undo this long hair and then come back and use it all over again. I'm going to cut it. I, I just recently cut my hair. It's growing back in now. So I'm going to just cut it all the way to where, as far as my hair goes and go from there. So it's not really a thing for me. I, I never really thought about it. And so this is why this, for me, was so interesting. And I had to be a part of it just because I, I need to find better ways of, of, of carrying on in life, of, as far as my hair journey goes, you know, I need to find ways that are, I don't even want to use the word sustainable anymore. I feel like we've mentioned it way too many times, but I need to, I need to find ways that in, in which I could contribute, you know, to, to, to make this world a little bit better, you know, for the next person, for my kids, I have kids. So for me, anything I can do to make the environment safer i'm gonna totally do that you know exactly. even if it's just the conversation that needs to be had i think that from there then we can you know f f come up with solutions so it just starts with conversations like this and then from there you know you can conquer the world i guess i don't know absolutely and i mean i think to tag on to sammy's point i think it's a lot of what I, well, the way I approach things is I try to think about myself as a small cog in like a bigger uh, system of things. And that really helps me, I think, do better in a way. Because as you said, I mean, I don't have kids yet, but I have siblings, younger siblings. I, I mean, I'm part of a family which is likely to go, I'm part of like the human race, which is likely to keep going. For a while so that in itself just sparks a little bit of okay this is not just about me but it's about the like other people to come for sure um sorry i'm just going to interject here and say i don't have business zoom which means i get a 40 minute cap on some of my um sessions um and this one has about eight minutes left on it so when it ends i will send a new link I think everyone on here is in the WhatsApp group, um, which is quite easy. So when this runs out, but to again, add on to what Lula said about the links between sustainability and I guess economics in a way, this was something that we spoke about quite a lot in the first uh, Kanekalon conversations was sustainability that um, arises out of necessity as opposed to out of desire. And this, I think, is something that is quite common in, I guess, the, the traditional frameworks of African living. And this is related to a lot of what I said in the overview of the post, is historically, um, Black people have a, a very innate and deep connection to nature and the earth. So we're likely to do things in a more mindful way by doing things in a more minimalist way, you know. But since like history has unfolded in the way that it has, we're adopting faster paces of life, which are disconnecting us a lot more, you know. And my example was I, I live on a farm and there are people who work on the farm. And again, just based on economics, we're living slightly different lives. I'm there in the concrete and glass house and 
then I guess they're more sustainable house by nature, but they are so resourceful in the way in which they do things, you know, like they don't feel the necessity to go to the shops or, I mean, it's a little bit more than not uh, seeing it as necessary, but not having the means to, but as opposed to buying like a green and yellow sponge to wash their dishes, they'll take like the, the fiber outside of an onion sack or a potato sack. And those are things that we just don't tend to think about um, because it's so out of this constrictive box that we live in, that is a supermarket, you know? And there's so many things that we could do to revert back to that. And admittedly, sometimes if you are somebody who cares about the way things look, you're not going to want to use like a, a potato sack for a dish sponge. But sometimes it's about understanding that it's more than what something looks like. So um, my washing up bowl, ordinarily I would have gone and bought like a pretty ceramic bowl with nice little designs on it. But I said, you know what, what's the point? I could just cut a milk bottle in half and use that. And I've been doing that and not only did I save my coins, I also saved a plastic bottle from a landfill for however much time. So extending life cycles of things that we already have, I think is important. Um, but then to, to go back to, I guess, the, the topic at hand, um, I feel like braiding hair, I didn't consider it an environmental pollutant for a while. But that's so strange because I feel like when I'm walking around, I see like about five braids in 500 meters, you know? <laughs> and like, I just wanted to find out from you guys, what's your experience with braiding hair in, out in the world? Yeah. Can I ask to, uh, if you could clarify, like experience in what way? Like, say, just like a spatial experience. Like, you're likely to find braiding hair in a hair salon, but when you find it out in the street or on the floor of Random a night, right. what's, what's going through your mind? What are you thinking? What happened, sis? <laughs> I think that's usually it. I'm like, what was going like on here? Okay, well? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How are your edges? <laughs> um, but I always think it's it's very true. But I also think about like the embarrassing experience of walking and losing your hair. I don't know if you, you know, I'm like, like I imagine that happening. Like if a braid was loose and I was walking and it suddenly dropped because there's this desire that it's mine and everyone must think it's mine. And so the idea of me walking and it drops, I'd be like, oh, that's not mine. I just keep walking. Like it's not on my head. You know, I don't know if, if my initial reaction would be, oh, let me pick it up. And, you know, because I want to be, I don't know if in that moment, the embarrassment would allow me to be sustainable in, in that way, like pick it up, go clean it, put my braid back in. You know, I think my first thought would be like, first of all, did anyone see that drop from my head? Um, but yeah, and I, I just wanted to add to what you were saying initially. I think that it's interesting how so many people have in their own ways um, practice like low impact living. Um, and sometimes it's just about understanding the framework or just having the language and it being accessible and smaller, because like you said, like Africans or black people just generally, that's something that we do, but we don't, we don't use those big words or those like, you know, exciting terms around it. And so we, we've kind of, I guess it's kind of become like an anti-black thing, even though it's a very black thing when we talk about the environment and when we talk about hair. So it's just been very interesting to hear that because even I was thinking, that's so true. Like we are actually very resourceful in our homes. Cause I remember going to the village in Uganda and we'd have this, um, what's it called? I can't remember the name of the, the fruit, but it's just like, it grows like a cucumber. And when it yeah. dries up, you use that mm -hmm. as the, like the scrub. And that was normal. Or it would be like you said, like the potato sack or the onion sack, like that was what you used. But then it became unattractive, you know? 
And so it's interesting to see how different spaces shift our ideas of self as well and how different spaces require us to present this thing and what are the impacts of that presentation to our environment and you know to just our systems of living so you you start to want to be less african in certain ways because i i do think in some ways when when maybe not with hair particularly but just in the in the way of recycling when you move from a potato sack to a loofah like a fancy loofah you're like oh i'm moving on up you know <laughs> <laughs> so it's just interesting how we think about those kind of things um and i'm sure even with hair when it's like synthetic hair or like depending on the type of hair our attitudes and our way of maintaining it and keeping it is probably different because of the kind of value we place on it so i think it's it's just interesting to hear all your stories. So thanks, guys. Sorry, I just rambled there. <laughs> oh, that was so insightful. Thank you for that. Like, again, there are no caps on what you can and can't say here. Hey, Banji. Yes, I'm here. I'm okay. just trying to settle. Okay, perfect. That's fine. Um, are you able to give us... Uh, a just give me a quick one, and then I'll get around to it. Hello? Pardon? Could you hear me? Hello. Hi. I think she asked for a second. Are you breaking a little? Let me. Okay, no problem. We can give you a second. Um, so I started the recording again, and I think it would be good for us to, I guess, pick up on the last point that we were speaking about, because I think that was quite um like an important and an insightful one. And like the, the, the point I felt like was, I guess the most stark to me, and this is also something Charity said in her introduction, was that often this um, like sustainability or ethical low impact lifestyle is something that African people, black people do naturally, but we don't have the vocabulary, the lexicon, or yeah, everything has been overcomplicated so much so that we get like sidelined from the narrative, you know? So I think it's important to, to rewrite that narrative because a lot of the stories about sustainability that are being told are from the Western perspective, which never gives us breathing room you know and to add to that I think even like in the the greater narrative of climate change and environmental impact beyond hair the west because of their rapid um, rapid rates of industrialization are actually the people creating most of the carbon emissions but the people who are getting hardest hit are people on the mother continent, you know. Look at Cyclone Idai, however many months ago. Look at how many droughts the continent is going through. So I think it's important for there to be like elevated awareness, like from, I guess, an educational perspective, to just let people know how important it is to be at the center of this narrative, not just even from a storytelling point of view, but from like a survival point of view, you know? Um, so yeah, um, before we go on, Kirill, would you like to do your intro? Yeah, sure, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, hi everyone. <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Kerry Ote. Lucy is my first name. Um, I'm from Kenya. And uh, the reason why I'm interested in this project is because clearly the having a more sustainable way of living is something that is very key right now because um, we are already living in times that are like we 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 enjoy um, the fruits of having a more industrialized um, age, but in the same breath, we are destroying the very earth that we're living in, and so we are 
limiting the kind of things that the future posterity might endure. And so if contribute less to destroying the earth, I'm very interested in that. And especially as someone who naturally gravitates towards uh, using uh, synthetic hair to, you know, keep up appearances all the time. I am rather keen to see how well I can reduce the use of the same or find a way to actually reduce the impact that my changing styles every three to four weeks has on like the environment in general. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I, I find it quite interesting that you used um, the phrase keeping up appearances, because I think in this uh, question and conversation about sustainability, especially in the black communities, it's something that we like ignore because it means going back to the basics and we want to keep up this appearance of being like higher on the social socioeconomic ladder and things like that which is completely nuts to me in a way but i guess you can also understand it from like a political perspective or like even a historical perspective where black people have been persecuted for so long that i guess capitalism or making money is one way that we really have almost a certain certain sense of autonomy to define our place in the world but again like industrialization at the price of what at the price of what um so my my second or third prompt question is in relation to the resource list that i sent um are there any like videos or links that particularly jumped out at you um sammy uh samantha i remember you responded to to the video about the recycled hair market in kenya and you're like i don't know how i feel about this can you let us know how you feel about it <laughs> I, for me it was just so ridiculous honestly and I, i'm not even you know trying to be whatever but that you would go to a garbage site pick up hair, wash it, I guess. I don't know how well they did it, but just from all that filth, pick up hair, wash it and sell it to someone, that was just so unacceptable for me. I just, I couldn't even fathom it. Like, how do you, how do you think that that's okay? Why is that an okay thing to do? I mean, if, if it's that you want to sell secondhand hair, hair that's been used before, whatever, um, wouldn't the best approach then be just to speak to people who don't want to use their hair anymore, like try to solicit that, like speak to people about it? Sorry, my I battery. I think that's the... No, but to Can pick I it up? Some... Oh, okay. Can we all hear? Yeah. <laughs> because so, I mean... I think that's what, like, with it links to the second question about urbanization, like, stick on the braid on the floor. Like, Ella was saying, I hope it's not mine. And then connecting that as well to, like, the language and the, how we create the systems around it. I think that links to race as well. Like, said the conversation is uh, much of the time given over to the West and white folk about sustainability or recycling. And how maybe we don't have the conversation with ourselves um, to create a system where we pick up the hair. You unbraid your hair and you put it in the, the bin. That is my hair that needs to be recycled. Please come and pick it up and wash it. So when, watch, when I watched the video, I was wondering about that. Like, oh, we're not even thinking about how best to um, recycle this plastic on our head. So we can't create, we're not creating the systems to do a better job of recycling and a healthier maybe job, something that removes a hazard and makes it more desirable to buy recycled hair. Um, and I think that goes to language. It is, I do think it's a storytelling thing in that sense. 
the job becomes a job of the people that work in the arts and culture to create the language and to, to entice, to create the conversation and create the enticing um, space uh, of imagining a world where we can do that because so many times it is externalized and it's pushed away from us and it's like it's a them problem it's such a big problem from the west that we don't maybe i've felt sometimes i didn't need to have agency because i was not dumping in africa my country is not dumping in africa i'm not bringing a horde of clothes that don't need to be used from my country just dumping them in a country i am in africa so what was me it. now how do we create the conversation we make it enticing how do we create the system this the, the, the system of recycling for hair that's what i thought when i said i thought it was unfortunate that the garbage um down thought hey now that i know maybe someone's thinking about about it. Uh, can i just say a question oh sorry no, go, go on you can go i'll, I'll go after you Okay, I think for me, uh, just responding to Samantha, um, like one of the things that's important about that video is putting it in the context. Like they're not, I think it's a very situational thing. Like this is our situation and this is an opportunity. Yes, it's the dumpster and it probably doesn't. Like I don't imagine any of us going and saying, yeah, we want to go buy hair from that place. But you have to think about even in the video, the market where the hair was being resold. Like, so there's like the context is necessary. Like they don't have in many ways, it's like, oh, if the hair can be restored, they don't have some of the luxury that we have to say, oh, I'm not getting hair from the dumpster. And I think that that also brings in a layer of how we're able to, like how we're able to navigate this, you know, recycling. And in some ways it's for us, even if it's not in the dumpster, I can say that I've definitely thought, oh, I'm not using that hair again. It'll be all matted up. Like, I'm not gonna, it'll, it'll look nasty, you know? So sometimes we have, um, I wouldn't say like a blindness, but sometimes it's like a privilege that we have that makes us look at that as like nasty. Whereas for them, that makes sense. Like they're not going to go buy it from another store. If it's way cheaper, it's cleaned. You can see it goes through like multiple layers um, of cleansing just so that it's, you know, acceptable. So, sorry. So, so I think that's, that, that's the only thing I would add is like when we look at um, situations of like where people maybe aren't being the most sustainable and where people are, we should always remember like the economical context in which those things exist as well. Because I think that adds, you know, in some ways, like Banji said, like in certain communities, that's a natural practice. They're always looking for innovative ways to save money and reuse things. And then in maybe other situations, like in mine, I might not always think, oh, let me save it. I might just be like, oh, let me just go get, get new hair. So that, that's all I would say is like the context of poverty and um, resources and access is also very important when we think about this. As much as it's something close to them, it's like it's close, but it may not be in the way that we would desire it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, I was just gonna add on to what um, Alava said, actually, I was gonna say something similar in the sense that um, the conversation about access also matters because the context for them is like, that's like, okay, this is a situation, like we've noticed there's a dumpster with um, hair that could be reused and like, how can we get from the point of we need extensions and we're hair braiders or we're resellers and we can't afford to buy the packaged stuff that comes from the factories and we have this product now in this state in a in a dumpster like it's not it's not ideal for certain people of certain classes in society i don't want to use the word classes but just to the word that's coming to my mind but then I ask the question of, um, do we have a, would we have a problem with that? Like our reaction to that video when you sent it to us, Randy, would it be the issue that it was here that re was recycled from a dumpster? 
or that it is just this idea of like keeping up appearances and I can afford to buy new hair straight from the factory. So let me do that. Because if you look at, um, you could draw parallels with, for example, like reused Indian hair, like that's hair that's recycled in a sense. And hair is a very personal thing. So this is human hair that comes from someone else's head. And some of the time we don't see the cleaning process of that. And we're just like, okay, you know what? This is hair and it comes in a bundle. Sometimes it doesn't even come in packaging. And we don't think of that. We're just like, okay, everyone does this. So it should be okay. And you're like, okay, I'm not thinking of where it's coming from. And like, this is the from someone. Of the soul. <laughs> That it's coming from. Sorry, Lulu. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not thinking of where it's coming from, but it's this this idea that we're in this system where it's the normal, it's the status quo. It's like, oh, everyone buys this. It doesn't come in a packaging, but like everyone does it, so it should be fine, you know. But then you have different people from different um, walks of life who have different access to different things at different levels, and if they're going to show you, they're going to clean it. I mean buy it if you want you know so I, I guess it's just looking at sustainability and also the different areas of society that there's, there's different levels to it so we should just be mindful of how how we think things to be normal or how we think there's a right way to be sustainable or there's a, a wrong way or that's like oh that's that's not something I would do, but then ask, we should ask ourselves why, why do you think that if it's gone through a cleaning process and if it's acceptable to you, like what's the next question should be, why wouldn't I, you know, is it because of a societal thing of keeping up appearances or is it because of a, it's a preference and you're just like, I know where it's coming from and I don't want it. So that's just something I thought of as well. Mm. And I mean, also, I think you, you've mentioned this already in your really uh, well-elaborated response, is the levels of transparency in that video. Like, I don't think the ladies are going and reselling their hair and saying, oh, this is hair that we, we bought from the Darling factory. They're saying straight up on video, I got this from point A, it's gone through this and this and this process, and now it is this final product which I'm presenting to you but who's to say that the hair that we buy on AliExpress or eBay or things like that haven't been through those very same processes because another thing that capitalism is very good at pushing people to do is find shortcuts around things you know and I think just because things are packaged signed sealed delivered in a in in like a professional way doesn't mean they are necessarily like that because in the resource list I also attached um, a YouTube video about or around a a hair factory in India and the conditions in that professional hair factory I was like sure like if you look at their website, it's all like pristine and like they have this face, but behind that veneer is a very similar, I guess, situation to what the, I guess, the, the rawness of the dump site was. And again, it's critically thinking about how much companies are showing us as part of their production processes, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I just I wanted to add and tag onto that point, Banji, about um, you know the facade that a lot of companies have versus the reality. And uh, you know I, we can definitely, um, since we started out and we've been dealing with lots of different suppliers, and the synthetic hair industry is very much kind of headquartered, if you like, in China, and that's where the majority of the production takes place, the manufacture of these hair extensions, um, and. Carol and I are very, very passionate about actually establishing better connections and more connections with suppliers in Africa because we feel like the practices and kind of the almost the mindset, I guess, and the kind of um, aspirations and culture, uh, sorry, and uh, values of of 
of Africa-based suppliers match ours a little bit more. That's not to take away or be, be derogatory towards the, the Chinese suppliers, but it's just from the conversations that we've had and the uh, research that we've done, we feel that there, there are a lot of um, shortcuts to, um, to, to the synthetic hair industry. And there's a lot that happens in terms of the production where um, the suppliers haven't necessarily always taken the care that you would want them to take or hope that they would take. Um, and also, I think that there's also a, a kind of mentality around the end consumer. I think from what we've seen with the Africa-based suppliers, there's more love was put into production and and the the uh, distribution of hair extensions from them than what we've seen compared to you know say for example a chinese supplier naming no names so it's I think it's all encompassing, but I completely agree with what Banji was saying around, um, you know, there's there's things that happen kind of behind closed doors, if you like, that you wouldn't necessarily like if you actually had that opportunity to see them. And I definitely think that there are dubious origins of both synthetic and human hair. And, you know, it's just, it, it's, it, I think the main thing is for the companies, and we try to be this way, to be transparent and to be open with their customers about where their hair or, originates from and, and how they're handled and how they, how they uh, produce it. And, you know, that's definitely something that we're striving to do more and more. And, uh, yeah, just the, the transparency is so important and questioning that transparency as well um, from the consumer end is so important because again we we get things packaged and in its final form and never really question where it's coming from so i think it's it's important to be able to peel back the layers and just see see where that's coming from um on the topic of recycling and in relation to what uh, sammy was speaking about um the the concept of systems not existing in place in where like the countries in which we are to recycle hair um in the different countries in which we are are there hair specific recycling schemes do you know or what's the the government state of recycling in your countries it doesn't have to be specific to hair because that's that's quite a a niche a niche thing but in general i don't think it's existent in zambia i mean just by going yes. into town and seeing how much is just thrown around and left there sometimes for long periods of time i think it becomes very clear that it's not something that we prioritize or even when you go into you know certain neighborhoods you find like dumpsters right by the house so like our ideas of getting rid of waste are uh, yeah, very complicated, you know, as much as we are a very, like, as you said, naturally, we recycle without even knowing, or we're very conscious of our environment without even sometimes knowing that we are. Um, when it comes to recycling and getting rid, I think, getting rid of things, I think our attitude and our values towards cleanliness sometimes are very questionable. And I think that's what links to how we view recycling. It's like, it's garbage. So as long as it's outside, now the idea of outside has to be, you know, everyone explains it differently. But generally, it's like, if it's not directly here, then I have justified it well enough, which is like, yeah, no, that's not how it works. I'd like to oppose that because, um, first of all, I say that because I don't think that... Zambians are very good at documenting things. I'm not particularly sure why, but um, I've had the privilege of, and these are not like projects on a large scale, but I've had the privilege of meeting communities of women who manage waste and reuse that waste to make like your plastic bags, like handbags or stuff that you'd find at Sunday market. That's on like a small scale. I think our problem in Zambia is we like, for lack of a better word, to be micromanaged in a sense that we can only do a bite size of it and we're not very good at collaborating on 
like Banji, you said earlier, being a small chef in part of like a big pot or a big meal that has to be prepared, or like a big goal and having like small little bite-sized, um, um, small bite-sized responsibilities to be able to achieve like a bigger goal. So I know of, um, this is at my mom's office, she works at FHI 360 and the, the, the Nemkem ladies who come to clean and they were talking about waste management or something like that in the office because they were like, oh my, oh my goodness, there's so much waste here and I guess they had to get permission to use the waste and be like, we want to use the plastic bottles or whatever. So my mom suggested to them that they come up with like a, a group and they register themselves and they start to do like waste management and collect waste from different offices. Because like Alawa said, some of the time it's this waste is collected and then it it's really just like, okay, it's waste. It's, it's there. Like it's, it's not part of me anymore. And I've done my part to sort of like put it there and it's rubbish. I don't know what happens with it after that. So I think from that mindset, it's uh, this this i feel like it's easier to do some achieve a goal if you break it down into little bite sizes and i genuinely think that in zambia there's this is slow but there's this upcoming waste management like there's an interest a genuine interest in like okay we should collect our waste and we should put it in a place but then we need people to be like okay we have this waste now are we going to sort it are we going to recycle it are we how can we get rid of it sustainably or how can we reuse it or things like that so i feel like it's a big goal and we need help breaking it down into little um into little pieces so that we achieve the main goal of being sustainable as a nation or a community or a household even. Absolutely. And I feel that it's um, like smaller, like more local or community based initiatives that are taking this uh, issue of waste management into their hands or putting it on their agendas. And that's extremely, it's great. Like, I love that they're doing it, but it brings up the point that the government is not doing what it should be doing because really they should be the ones um, orchestrating big waste management groups, writing policies that ensure that garbage collecting companies don't just go and dump. You know, because I've noticed that you get, <laughs> this is so ridiculous to me that you get, oh no, uh, we've got the limit again, but you get like actual viable companies who own like tons of trucks who have a good steady income, but they, they collect this waste and they go and dump it in the middle of the city. Surely that is something that a good functioning government wouldn't permit, you know, and it's just extremely disheartening but inspiring the way that local communities are taking this into their own hands and saying okay what can we do but again this is because the people in the governments are living in their gated communities far far away from this waste that they don't feel like they're directly mm. affected or impacted by it you know um but yeah it's, it's an um, um, yes. Um, so I, I think I have three different um, concepts to speak to. One is the institution or university space, the municipal space, and then I guess the, the city um, or the urban environment. When I was at city, have they created the thin system, the color coding system. So that's how um, waste collection would happen, you have your plastics, paper, and general waste. And that was um, Stellenbosch. And that was a system throughout the town. It's a university town. And that's how it functioned. But when you also drive out to Cape Town, you find that that's exactly how it works as well. Uh, you'll find the color system and it, in the municipality then, and, um, and also the political party in charge. But, um, I think those weird thing as well but they were like let's keep Cape Town clean let's make this international city stay the way it is and then encourages um they encourage waste management that way 
um, moving to Johannesburg and Pretoria, it's a different conversation completely. But also it is, um, it's really interesting and cool to see um, incentivized waste management. So you have trolley, people trolley pushing and collecting plastic. And I think as well, maybe collecting textile and different, yeah, textile and different kinds of waste. And it's incentivized because when they take it to the center, they get money for it. So, and it's, it's really complicated. I think I know, except that I've experienced moving around in the city and it's in the city as a new citizen, how we have um, Pretoria and Chinesburg have a huge waste issue. And the huge problem with these people trying to like folk trying to make money off of the waste because there is a waste problem, a waste issue, and people can actually then uh, make money from that and from collecting that waste. The different context and um, situations I've seen. I wish that we did have color coding to encourage people um, in the city, but we have people trolley pushing and getting their cash and for and for managing the waste um, in isolated spaces. Thank you, thank you. That was super super insightful, and I agree that I guess if you're operating in developing countries in a way where it's like not going to be the first thing on your mind to recycle reframing it and incentivizing it will not only i guess make a way for people to make money which they need to do but will also i guess one up on being aware of um the impacts and like the solutions to it for sure Kirill, what's a what's a waste management like in Kenya? Nairobi, you're in Nairobi, hey. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I'm in Nairobi, and um, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Banji, I can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Yes, darling. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I think uh, my my uh, the situation in Kenya is just as it is in Pretoria and Cape Town, basically South Africa. Um, yes, we do have uh, existing policies on recycling. But that being said, it is not necessarily being implemented at um, a national scale. It's more individuals and smaller companies taking up um, the implementation of the same and municipalities. But that is also not strictly enforced because, yes, we do have, um, especially within the central business district, we do have marked bins for the different um, types of waste, but not everyone uh, is, is aware of um, how best to approach the whole recycling problem. And so often it is lost on people um, to dump uh, waste in the correct bins for like the proper recycling process. That being said, um, for the most part, uh, the policy, uh, or rather the policies in place have helped a lot more with um, recycling of plastics and plastics, metals, and um, glass objects, because uh, you find, uh, just as it was mentioned earlier for the case in South Africa, there are incentives for collecting what's it called, um, glass bottles and taking them back to the factories, in this case, either the beer factories or uh, factories like Coca-Cola so that they're recycled and reused. Um, in other cases, you have uh, companies such as Kitengela Hot Glass that uses um, some of these other uh, glass objects that are not necessarily from 
uh, the beverage companies to create new objects. So you'd find glass beads and um, chandeliers and new glasses, cutlery and things like that, crockery rather, um, being uh, remodeled from old bro uh, broken glass. Uh, for the case of plastics, uh, a number of them are taken back to the plastic uh, fa uh, factories, especially um, the case of plastic bottles for things like cooking oil and uh, paint buckets and things like that. They are often collected uh, at small decentralized places, but usually in like a, a, a an estate or uh, a section of the city where it, it is known that if you're trying to get rid of a, a bunch of uh, plastic bottles, then you can take them to the space and exchange them for cash. And then from there, they go back to the factories and the whole um, recycling process takes place. For uh, met uh, metallic objects as well, th that is the same case. So. Um, but I'm not too conversant with uh, the metals, but there are cases of uh, collection and uh, recycling or, or other, yes, I would presume recycling of uh, metals because we have a whole industry based off uh, scrap metals. Uh, in Kenya, it's known as the Joakali industry. So they take the scrap metals and then they're remodeled and used to make other objects. So that, that's uh, pretty sums, uh, sums up uh, the situation on recycling policies in Kenya as far as I know. It's not exhaustive, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry guys, I muted myself and forgot to unmute myself. Um, but yeah, I've noticed in the different uh, narratives across the globe, the conversation about recycling hair still isn't being um, had and being done. So I think it's great that Tiwani has recognized this and is uh, making steps towards making this an accessible recycling scheme. Um, Again, this, uh, the video is going to end. Time just seems to be spilling over today, which is, uh, I guess, a good thing because we have so much to say. Um, okay, so I think um, if anyone has any last thoughts now as winter lay them down. I don't know why I just spoke like that, but um, I think it's Sunday and I'm getting tired. Um, but yeah, as I said, I will keep okay. in contact. Um, does anyone... Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh yes, yeah. so just to wrap it up with everything that everyone has said, I feel like you mostly concentrated on the plastics and the bottles and whatever else people are picking up. But like you said in the last point, no one really talked about hair and how people are recycling it. Could it be that our communities don't know exactly how we can go about that? And uh, if policies are in place to recycle waste, why isn't it being done in our local communities? Is it that we as people in the local communities need to go out there and teach people and learn how to recycle these things for ourselves and then teach them before we wait on the government? What can we do there? I just need some last thoughts on that. <laughs> no, it's can I just <laughs> say quick? Oh, sorry, Banji. No, go, go, go off to you, my lover. Um, so, I, like I had said in the beginning, this is something that I did try and explore earlier on, I think last year. And one of the things that I realized from talking to people was that in, in Zambia, particularly, our we hold hair, hair is very sacred. And like the idea of taking something from your head and using it for something like, uh, we have like spiritual things that we think about when we think about hair there's all kinds of witchcraft ideas so as much as as much as we want to be sustainable i think within the context of africa we'll also have to deconstruct many ideas around how something that's held on your head can also have other uses right because it's like 
how our, you know, your dirty laundry, like you don't put your panties outside. I think our ideas around hair are the same. So it's, you know, it's linked to all these like rituals and different things. So in Zambia, I think that would be one of the things that would help us um, kind of break down why we don't recycle hair more in hair salons, for example, which is interesting because you let them cut your hair and you don't know jack about most of these people. But if someone came to you and said, oh, I'm taking the hair that you used on your head and we're going to use it for something else, you'd be like, um, how about no? Well, exactly. You know? Exactly. So that's one of the reasons that I've come across is that we have our ideas of self and our culture around our hair and, and like just things on the body is just very sacred. So we'd have to deconstruct and reconstruct how we look at hair as being something that doesn't have to be wasted and doesn't have to be linked to, you know, being uh, attacked in some ritual way and can actually be used to, we can actually use it to, um, I mean, just be more environmentally conscious about how we recycle our hair and it doesn't have to just go into a dumpster and get burnt. Because a lot of, I think in like a lot of places, they pile it together and they burn it because that way you've like cut off all potential ties to another world. Um, so yeah, just keeping that, that thinking or that context in mind as well when we think about recycling, whether it's with clothing or hair or, or anything, you know, cultures is really deep too. That's very true. But I think on like, it's not a but, it's an additive thing to a different point um, on recycling hair. I think one of the, the ways that I've found I can do it is by using it in art. And there's someone that's part of our group called Artis, and I sent a link to her, her Instagram profile, but she's been doing amazing things with hair. Like she crocheted a whole dress out of braids and there's so many different ways that we could extend the lifeline because again this thing about um it's, it's sometimes it's not always recycling it can be upcycling you know because sometimes the recycling um conversation just puts it in a bit of a box so I think maybe yeah. that's that's a good point to to pick up on the next time we speak is what ideas are bubbling in all our heads about what we can do with our hair. Because I guess the end product of this research project is, so it's part of a writer's residency. I want to create a piece of interactive art, um, I guess somehow find a way to do it whether that be like installations or whatever so the next session we have we can specifically speak about upcycling or recycling hair thank you guys for having me chew your ears off for an hour and a half an hour and 40 actually it's been really lovely to have to have you guys here the group is there um to keep Oh, shame. Someone's trying to join now. Uh -oh. um, the, da, 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 da. Yeah, the group is there. If you have more things to add, you can send voice notes, you can send links, you can send questions, etc. I'm here. Um, and I'm sure everyone else is open as well to be part of it. So yeah. Thank you, guys. Wait, thank you for having me. <laughs> hey. Thank you for having us and putting oh, us together. Yeah, yeah. Wait, can I just quickly take a, a screenshot? I realize I should have done this when I had everybody here. But, um, okay. Charity, where'd you go? Okay, there we go. Okay, ready? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I'll do as well is I'll send all the audios to you guys via the groups or via an email so you know what it is that I have um, on file. Okay. All right. Ciao. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care. <laughs>